Before we get into today's video, I want to remind you we're on our road to 100,000 subscribers. And if we can get there by the time Tears of the Kingdom comes out, we'll be giving away a collector's edition of the game. That's Steelbook, the pin set, the art book, the poster. Oh my gosh. What are you guys waiting for? Why not subscribe to the channel? And let's get into today's video. Good old Doug Bowser. What a chad, right? <laughs> we honestly don't hear from Nintendo's brass very often. Let's just... Let's just be real here. Furukawa, we essentially only hear about at the financial briefings, and Doug Bowser shows up at major launch events. Otherwise, we really don't hear from him either. In fact, I could argue we hear about news and, and interviews from Doug Bowser almost as often as we hear about actual official news on Metroid Prime 4. <laughs> Sorry, did that one sting a little bit? That's okay. The game is still being made, so at least we know that. They haven't removed it from their, you know to be announced <laughs> release date uh, schedule. Anyways, I want to talk today about Tears of the Kingdom. Of course, I like talking every day about Tears of the Kingdom, but good old Doug Bowser gave us a reason to talk about it because he did an interview recently with the Associated Press. And what's interesting in this interview is a, a number of things. Most of it's just marketing fluff. There's not a whole lot you can read into it unless you just want to overanalyze and think everything he says is gospel one point he said switch has a healthy three years ahead of it or something it's look we'll talk about that in a different video because i think some people are overblowing his words a little bit uh you've got to remember he's in the reggie fils role except he has even less power than reggie fils because reggie fils was actually on the board in japan doug bowser is not uh but what i can say and i find this interesting is that doug bowser's primary job is to run the marketing for Nintendo, right? That's Nintendo of America is primarily a marketing arm. They do have QA testing and they also have, you know, localization and stuff like that, but they're mostly a marketing arm. That is what Doug Bowser himself manages most is, is, is marketing. So obviously when he's asked a question about the price point of Tears of the Kingdom, he is going to fluff it up, right? He's never going to say it's a mistake. He's never going to argue that it has anything to do with inflation or anything like that. He's going to make it sound like it's a positive reason. So we got to keep that in mind as we read this because it's going to come with that positive spin. But it so happens to be a positive spin that maybe might actually get backed up when the game comes out, and we'll talk about this. So the question asked of him was, how did you get to a $70 price figure uh, for the upcoming Zelda game? And he said, we look at what the game has to offer. I think fans will find this is an incredibly full, deeply immersive experience. The price point reflects the type of experience that fans can expect when it comes to playing this particular game. This isn't a price point that we'll necessarily have on all our titles. It's actually a fairly common pricing model, either here or in Europe or other parts of the world, where the pricing may vary depending on the game itself. So what's interesting here, of course, is he's basically noting, hey, other people are charging 70 bucks, and we haven't been doing that. But the reason we're doing it for this game has to do with how incredibly full and deeply immersive it is and that the price point reflects the experience fans can expect. And at $70, with those kind of words, I get it. It's marketing speak, but it's heavily suggesting that Tears of the Kingdom is a much deeper and fuller experience than Breath of the Wild, and that at $70, bucks, fans should be expecting this game to basically be the greatest video game Nintendo's ever put out there. That, like, let's just be frank. Breath of the Wild is rated as one of the best video games of all time. It's, it, it's right up there. It's like percentage points ahead of Super Mario Odyssey, a little bit behind Ocarina of Time, although there was a lot less reviews for that back in the day, so would that have held up if it had 100-plus reviews? I don't know. But it's very, very interesting to think about this prospect of a game that is grander, more full, and just a better overall experience than Breath of the Wild. Because a huge concern about the game is, oh, it's just going to feel like DLC. It's not going to do enough different. And here's Doug Bowser saying, look, at 70 bucks, you should just expect this thing to be the greatest thing since sliced bread. This should be the expectation he wants fans to have is that this is going to be the greatest game ever made. Uh, that's basically what he's throwing out there since 
justifying 70 over 60 compared to Breath of the Wild, uh, the way he's justifying it heavily suggests that. Now, this is marketing speak, of course, and the game very well might not back up his claims. You know, a lot of us know that they're charging 70 bucks because they can get away with charging 70 bucks, and they want to experiment with raising prices, likely to start doing that more often in the future, right? Try to raise the price of the next Mario Kart. Try to raise the price of the next Mario game. Maybe start looking at raising the price of Pokemon, even though Pokemon's Price increase from 3DS to Switch was already a pretty big leap. You know, they, they they see the 20 plus million they're selling of Pokemon now, and they go, what if we could squeeze an extra 10 bucks out of every copy, right? You know, the Pokemon company will be all for that. So it, it's very interesting to see uh, Nintendo experiment with that price point, and our fear of it being applied to more and more games from Nintendo, uh, I think is fully justified, especially since Tears of the Kingdom likely is going to sell well, and I don't know that this is the exact reasoning they're actually selling it at 70. This is just the marketing spin they're putting on that $70 price. But still, I gotta say, you know, if the game ends up backing up his words, ends up being the greatest thing since sliced bread, ends up being the best game Nintendo's ever put out there, I mean, look. If it ends up not being a marketing spin and turns out to be reality, kudos to Nintendo, I suppose. And if that ends up being the case, you know what they just did. They made it so any $70 price point from Nintendo should be expected to be the absolute best thing in a given IP they've ever done. Uh, that is quite the uh, expectation you want to put on consumers for $70 games. Uh, maybe this means things like Mario sports games in the future won't be $70 ever because Nintendo doesn't want the expectations put on it that it's clearly not going to reach. So maybe they don't abandon that $60 price point entirely, but they just use it for what they think are their biggest and best and going to be game of the year type of games. Uh, and if that's the case, I I'm mostly okay with that. Like if they want to increase... The price of the next major 3D Mario game because I think it's going to be a 95 plus rated game and be up for game of the year. Look, I'm kind of okay paying 10 extra dollars. I would have been okay paying 10 extra for Mario Odyssey because of how amazing that game is. So I can understand the arguments to want to increase the price on your your your, your top tier games. May, may make there be a price tier difference between. Breath of the Wild and Mario Odyssey versus Mario Tennis Aces and whatever. Granted, a lot of us would just say, we'll just lower the price of Mario Tennis Aces and stuff like that, make that 40 bucks. But yeah, yeah, companies don't like the lower prices. They like to raise them. So I, I'm kind of okay if that's what ends up happening, although most of us are worried that they're just going to raise the price of everything to 70 and that this is a bunch of hogwash. Now, he was also asked if they had any sales goals for the new Zelda game. And Doug Bowser's response is pretty typical. We do, but we are not disclosing those publicly at this time. Um, so yeah, of course they have sales goals. They, they have sales goals for every game they release. It was a really weird question. Uh, I, I, I would have tried to maybe frame that question a little different if you want to ask a sales goal. I would have said, do you expect this to sell as well as Breath of the Wild? Like That, that would have been how I would have phrased the question. And I wouldn't have phrased it as, does Nintendo you know, have an internal sales goal that, that says it'll do as well as Breath of the Wild. What are your expectations? Uh, th that's how I would have phrased it. You would have got probably a better answer than, oh, we don't reveal any numbers publicly. But because maybe you want to see, hey, Breath of the Wild's incredible and we think this thing can do, you know, Breath of the Wild numbers or something. I have no idea. I have no idea what their internal sales target is. And uh, we may never know. We, we don't know the internal sales target for most of Nintendo's games outside of when they release like a statement that says this exceeded or this is the fastest ever or this or that or set a new record. You know, like that. that's when you're like, OK, it exceeded their expectations. But uh, we don't hear that very often from Nintendo. We also don't hear uh, when it's disappointing sales either. Like if Bayonetta 3 is considered disappointing sales from Nintendo, you're never going to hear that from Nintendo. So... It's life. Uh, I'm just really excited to play Tears of the Kingdom. We're 59 days away at the time of recording of this video. I've got other content I need to get to today. This is the first video, by the way, in fully edited in Final Cut on our brand new Mac Studio. Uh, I, I just want to make sure I show my appreciation to all of you guys. Uh, the Mac Studio, for those who don't know, uh, my main editing computer, uh, w like basically bit the dust. It was a Windows PC. 
uh, custom Windows PC from that, that I've had for a couple of years. Uh, it bit the dust while editing a video. Oh gosh, how long ago? About two months ago now. And uh, a decision was made at that time that we were going to make the biggest investment into this YouTube channel we've ever made. And we've bought tons of equipment, right? We've got, you know, Electro Voice RE20s. You know, those are expensive microphones. We got an $800 uh, Rodecaster Pro 2. We, we've got, uh, a, a, you know, a lot of equipment. You know, we got a camera that cost a couple grand. But we decided that we were going to make the biggest investment in this YouTube channel now that I'm doing it full time and purchase uh, a computer that we feel will not only last significantly longer than a couple of years, but also one that's actually tailor-made and better suited for what we do here. That being a Mac Studio from Apple, which is a complete change for me. I'm switching from Windows that I've been using for most of my life, 25 plus years, over to Mac OS, which I do not know at all, and I'm slowly learning. And I'm also switching off of uh, Premiere, which has a, 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 a huge crashing problem in addition to a monthly fee, to over to Final Cut, where I just buy it and I own it. But I also don't know how to edit with it because its timeline works completely different than Premiere's does. So there's a lot of, there's sort of a, a steep learning curve initially, but I think once I get past how the timeline works, we'll be all good. Uh, but Guys, this this investment wasn't just your um, an, an easy to make decision. Uh, we didn't just get the standard Mac Studio. Uh, we went balls to the wall uh, between everything between the Mac Studio cost and all the accessories uh, for it to be able to run our setup. Uh, we spent over five thousand dollars, and I want to let you guys know how thankful I am for all of you guys' support. Uh, we were able to pay for this entirely uh, with the money this channel makes. Um, and the goal is obviously to create bigger and better content for you long haul. The content might still be simplified for a little bit while I'm learning. Obviously, I'm not back on camera this video. But I'm hoping by the end of you know this month, if not next month, we start getting into more complicated edits. I get back on camera uh, and we're, we're just rolling. So... Thank you guys so much uh, for allowing us to make that sort of investment in the channel. And I hope uh, it pays off in the end, not only for our workflow here, but also pays off with higher quality videos for you guys in the future with way better editing and, and a lot, lots of crazy visual stuff I want to do in the video side. Uh, as an example, when we're talking about sales numbers, I would like to have some fancy custom charts. Uh, I would like to have... Um, spec charts and all that when we're talking about specs for the next system compared to other platforms I'd like to be able to do some really fancy charts uh, I also want to have some better transitions and crazier effects and there's a lot of stuff uh, I'm digging into but for right now we're just getting to the basics of Final Cut as I'm sort of relearning uh, how to edit videos all over again it, it's, it's a weird experience for me but you guys are amazing and awesome and I just wanted to make sure I showed my appreciation to the community for enabling us uh, to make a decision like this. And uh, let's get to editing, shall we? Catch you in that next video.